And back in the book of Exodus, this is Exodus chapter 17. And this is a really great chapter. In Exodus chapter 17, you got the fight with Amalek. And we've got a lot of great truths in this chapter. One of my favorite illustrations of prayers in this chapter. It says in verse 1, And all the congregation of the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin after their journeys, according to the commandment of the Lord, and pitched in Rephidim, and there was no water for the people to drink. So, when you come from the wilderness of sin, like they just did, it takes you to a place with no water. See that? They journeyed from the wilderness of sin, and there was no water for the people to drink. Think about that for a minute. You come from the wilderness of sin, there's no water for the people to drink. That's Luke 16, 24. That rich man, what did he do? He died in his sins. He ended up in a place with no drink. Luke 16, 24 said, And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. If you die with your sin on your soul because you didn't come to Jesus Christ to be your Savior, then you're going to end up in a place with no water. Jesus Christ is the living water. He can quench your soul's thirst. In John 19, 28, it says, After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the Scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Jesus said that when he had every sin of everybody on him on the cross. Sin takes you to a place of thirst. So when all the congregation of the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin after their journeys, according to the commandment of the Lord, and pitched in Rephidim, and there was no water for the people to drink. Wherefore the people did chide with Moses. So they, they chided at Moses. They scolded at him, reproved him. You know, they're asking, is the Lord among us or not? They said, give us water that we may drink. And Moses said unto them, why chide ye with me? Wherefore do ye tempt the Lord? You see, they are tempting the Lord God. And the thing is, he's already proved to be among them. He doesn't need to prove anything else. Just like he's already proved to you that he loved you and he's died for you. If that's all Jesus Christ ever did for you was die on the cross for your sins, he's shown you plenty. He doesn't have to show you anything else. But they're tempting the Lord by saying all this. He's already done all these great miracles. He's already got them out of Egypt. He's already rained down manna from heaven. What more do they want? But he's proved to be among them. But what do they still do? They tempt the Lord. You know, you don't want to tempt the Lord. Constantly complaining. Constantly murmuring. Constantly doing something that you know you shouldn't be doing. It's kind of like you're tempting God in a way. And the people thirsted there for water. And the people murmured against Moses and said, Wherefore is this that thou hast brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst? You see, these murmurings here, it's against the Lord. Not just the messenger, Moses. It's against the one who's gave them the message, the one who's given them the, the, the plan and the purpose of what to do. So, this murmuring, it's, it's these complaints, complaints and muttering and just constantly, they'll just be walking on the journey and just, you can hear them back there in a low voice, just, just complaining and murmuring, kind of like you hear people do at work every day, just complaining, because you can't be content with anything. You know, Paul says, be content with such things as you have. He says, let your conversation be without covetousness. Paul says, in whatever state he's in, he's learned to be, to be content. That's where you need to be. This complaining and murmuring, 
muttering under your voice everywhere you go. That shows that you're not content with such things as you have. And it really gets to the Lord. So they murmur against Moses, the messenger. But truly, they don't despise Moses. They despise the one who gave the message to the Lord. And they said, Wherefore is this that thou hast brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst? Egypt wasn't any better. Egypt was way worse. They were in bondage to Pharaoh. And they're thinking back to the old life. Just like we do. We, we get in a bad way in our life. We go through some trials and tribulations. We start wanting to go back to Egypt. And a lot of times somebody can be talking about their old life before they were saved. And they just get this huge smile on their face. That shows me that they're v missing Egypt. They're missing their old life. They're missing living for the flesh, for the old man. You don't want to think back on those on that old life and be so attached to it. You know, what fruit had ye in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? The things that I did before I was saved, I don't even want nobody to know I did them. I don't even want to talk about them. When somebody asked me if I did such or such a long time ago before I was saved, I'm almost tempted to lie and say that I didn't do it. But I just, you have to tell the truth. You, you And you can use it as your testimony, just like Paul said. He was a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but he obtained mercy because he did it ignorantly in unbelief. you got to have a balance to it. You don't want to dwell on those things and and almost be happy that you did them but at the same time you could use it as your testimony like paul did but you don't want to get to a place where you want to go back to it they're wanting to go back to egypt and they're murmuring they're complaining and these murmuring and complaining is against the lord look at verse <clears throat> look at another verse in exodus sixteen eight. And I'll show you that this isn't against Moses. It's really against the Lord. It says in Exodus 16, 8. And Moses said, This shall be when the Lord shall give you in the evening flesh to eat, and in the morning bread to the full. For that the Lord heareth your murmurings, which ye murmur against him. And what are we? Your murmurings are not against us, but against the Lord. They don't despise Moses so much. They despise the Lord. They despise his commandments. They despise the situation that he's got them in. Now look back at Exodus 17 and verse 4. Or verse 3. It says, Wherefore is this that thou hast brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst? You see, before they were complaining about hunger. Back there in Exodus 16 and verse 3, that's when the Lord had to rain down manna from them. So he's given them manna, now they're complaining about thirst. And they've also murmured about water already. Back in Exodus 15, 24. And this just, this really, it tempts the Lord. In Numbers 14, 22, it says, Because all those men which have seen my glory... And my miracles, which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, and have tempted me now these ten times, and have not hearkened to my voice. You see, they've seen his glory, they've seen miracles. Yet they're still doubting God. They're still, imagine going through, seeing the event of the Red Sea, and going through the Red Sea, and knowing that God did that, and then you're still complaining. That's a crazy thing. And Paul warns about this in the New Testament. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 9 through 10, he says, Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. God was very angry with this whole situation and that should remind us to 
you know, get up and just be thankful for everything you got. And don't just complain about everything all day. I mean, we could be burning in hell right now. We could be just someplace starving to death right now. We always, you can always think this. I've always got it better than this guy. I've always got better than somebody else. Somebody may have it better than you out there, but you've always got it better than somebody else, and we got more than what we deserve. So just don't go around murmuring, complaining. Verse 4 of Exodus 17. And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, What shall I do unto this people? They be almost ready to stone me. So Moses... He's he's trying to give out the message of the Lord. He's trying to lead people the Lord's way. And they're about ready to stone him. In Numbers 14, 6 through 10, it says, And Joshua the son of Nun, and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, which were of them that searched the land, rent their clothes, and they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search it, it is an exceeding good land. If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it us, a land which floweth with milk and honey. Only rebel not ye against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bred for us. Their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us, and fear them not. But all the congregation bade stone them with stones. You see that? All Joshua wanted to do was go in and possess the land that was promised to them by the Lord, and the Lord was going to help them do it, he was wanting them to go further with the Christian life, make things better, improve, grow in grace. But what do they want to do? They want to stone him. And people will do that to you in your life. If you're trying to get somebody better, you have to understand that they're going to get mad at you, and they're going to eventually just want to do away with you. They wanted to stone Moses with stones. What was he the one trying to do? Get them to someplace better. What was Joshua wanting to do? Get them to someplace better. What did they want to do to them? Stone them with stones. That's just how it is. They wanted to stone Joshua. They wanted to stone Moses. They wanted to stone David in 1 Samuel 30 and verse 6. They wanted to stone David, and David was greatly distressed, for the people spake of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved every man for his sons and for his daughters. But David encouraged himself and the Lord his God. Okay, so you're going along in your Christian life, and you're doing what you need to do, and you got these people around you that are mad at you, don't like how you do it, they think you're overboard, they think you're too strict. They think you're uh, just crazy. And they just want rid of you. You could do what David did. Just encourage yourself and the Lord. You got him. You still got him. And it doesn't matter about everybody else. So they, they wanted to stone Moses. They wanted to stone Joshua. They wanted to stone David. They did stone Stephen in Acts 7, 58 through 60. They stoned Paul in Acts 14, 19. They stoned Naboth in 1 Kings 21, 14. And they wanted to stone Jesus in John 8, 59. So you see that? All these great men of the Bible were stoned or they wanted to stone them. So Moses said, they almost be ready to stone me. And Exodus 17, 4. Now, Exodus 17, 5. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go on before the people, and take with thee of the elders of Israel, and thy rod, wherewith thou smutest the river, take in thine hand, and go. If I had the title for this, it would be, Go on. You know, go on, and don't fear. Don't fear the people. God is stronger than the people. You and God are the majority. Moses... And God is the majority. If God had to, he could just wipe out all of Israel and start over with Moses. You know, go on and don't fear. That's what Moses needs to do. Be not afraid of them. Ezekiel 2 and verse 6 
says, And thou, son of man, be not afraid of them, neither be afraid of their words. Though briars and thorns be with thee, and thou dost dwell among scorpions, be not afraid of their words, nor be dismayed at their looks, though they be a rebellious house. They're nothing but flesh anyway. But if you're doing what God wants you to do, you got the Lord. So he says, go on before the people. And that rod that you got, take that in thine hand and go. That rod, that same rod that he used that became a serpent, the same rod that he used to part the Red Sea. He says, behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Horeb. And thou shalt smite the rock, <clears throat> and there shall come water out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. So he says, I will always stand before thee. He says that to Moses. And this is always the case for you. You always have the Lord standing with you. In Colossians 1.27 it says, To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. If you're saved, the Lord Jesus Christ is always with you. He never leaves you. You have Christ in you, the hope of glory. So the same way Moses had the Lord standing with him, you have God standing with you. And notice that rock. You know what that's a picture of? It's a picture of the Lord. Jesus is the spiritual rock. In 1 Corinthians 10.4. Look at 1 Corinthians 10.1. It says, Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. So you see that? This rock is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. In John 4 and verse 11, it says, The woman saith unto him, this is the woman at the well, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. So Jesus Christ is the rock, and from him comes the water that will quench your thirst eternally. So Jesus is the rock. He's the true rock. Deuteronomy 32.15 Deuteronomy 32.15 says, But Jeshua waxed, waxed fat and kicked. Thou art waxen fat, fat. Thou art grown thick. Thou art covered with fatness. Then he forsook God which made him and lightly esteemed the rock, capital R, of his salvation. De Deuteronomy 32.13 And he made him ride on the high places of the earth, that he might eat the increase of the fields. And he made him to suck honey out of the rock and oil out of the flinty rock. The Lord Jesus Christ is that rock. The world's rock is not as our rock. He's the stone of stumbling and the rock of offense. He's the stone cut without hands. So the, the rock pictures the Lord. They're going to get water out of this rock. And you know what? The same way that they got water out of the rock, look what happens with the Lord when he dies on the cross for us. Look at John 19 and verse 34. In John 19, 34, the Lord's being crucified, and it says, But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith 
came there out blood and water. So Jesus Christ is the stone of stumbling, the rock of offense. He's our rock. And that's where you get water. I got this highlighted in red here next to 17.6. The red trail of the Lord Jesus Christ. You can find Jesus Christ in every chapter on every page. So Jesus Christ is the rock. In John 7, 38, John 7, 38, it says, He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. He's your way to water. Now, verse 7 in Exodus 17, And he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah, because of the chiding of the children of Israel, and because they tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Massa means temptation. Meribah means chiding or strife. See, did you did you realize that Israel hasn't even gone through a war a war yet, like a physical war with a an opposing army? God's putting them through some things first. You see, in Exodus 12, that's a picture of your salvation, the Passover. And then you got Exodus 13, them crossing the Red Sea. That's a picture of you, you getting baptized. And then uh, you got ex in Exodus 16, you got God raining down manna from heaven. That's a picture of you getting in the Word of God. And now you got a picture of them going through some trials and stuff here you know they're hungry they're thirsty you see god will oh yeah another thing is remember how he didn't lead them one way lest they see war and that's just like with your christian life it said in exodus thirteen seventeen, and it came to pass when pharaoh had let the people go that God led them not through the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, Lest peradventure the people repent when they see war, and they return to Egypt. You see, that's a picture of how, right when you get saved, God will many times make it easier for you starting off, lest you repent when you see war. He puts you on a little honeymoon with him first, puts you through some little small things first, before you see the war. And that's what's going on with Israel here. He's taking them through Massa. Temptation and Mariba. Which means chiding or strife. And putting them through these little things. Before they get to the war. So he called the name of the place Massa and Mariba. Because of the chiding of the children of Israel. And because they tempted the Lord saying. Is the Lord among us or not? Now, look what we get into. So, they've had some victories. They've had some failures with their complaints. And now they've just had this great victory of water out of the rock. So they're happy. They're rejoicing. But look at verse 8. This phrase, Then came Amalek. Amalek's always going to show up. Amalek is a picture of the flesh. Amalek is a descendant of Esau. In 1 Samuel 15, 2, 1 Samuel 15, 2, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I remember that which Amalek did to Israel, how he laid wait for them in the way when he came up from Egypt. Amalek is always going to be bugging you. It's a picture of your flesh. It, it bugs Israel throughout the Old Testament. Because it's a picture of the flesh. It says, Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. Every day when you wake up, you know what you got to do. You got to die daily. You got to reckon yourself to be dead. Because then here's going to come Amalek. You had a great victory yesterday. But here's Amalek. 
looking you right in the face in the mirror as soon as you get up. So then came Amalek and fought with Israel and Rephidim. Galatians 5.17. And Galatians 5.17, it says, For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so that, ke that you cannot do the things that you would. Your flesh is probably your most annoying enemy that you have, the one that bothers you the most. But you got to go on. Just like he told Moses, go on. You need to go on and don't fear. You need to go on, go out. You need to go on and don't fear. You need to go out and fight the war. And you're at war with the flesh every day. And Moses said unto Joshua, choose us out men and go out. See that? In verse 5, he told Moses, go on. You know, go on. Don't fear them. Verse 9, go out and fight with Amalek. You need to go out and fight with the flesh. And he tells Joshua to choose. Choose out some men. So Joshua, now remember Joshua is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. Joshua's name means the same thing as Jesus' name and Joshua's name is the Old Testament name for Jesus. And in the New Testament, it actually calls Joshua Jesus. So Moses said unto Joshua, he chose Joshua. And this is the first mention of the name Joshua, actually. And in Acts 7.45, it actually calls Joshua Jesus. He tells him to choose out men. So he's trusting in Joshua enough for Joshua to choose out some mighty men to go fight with Amalek. It's, and Moses says, Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. That same rod of God that he's been using all this time. So he tells Joshua to choose out men. Joshua is Moses' minister. He's also called Hosea in Deuteronomy 32. And he's called Jesus in Acts 7.45. And he's called a servant in Numbers 11.28. He's called O'Shea in Numbers 13.16. And I want you to notice that Joshua is the one doing the fighting. Moses is at the top of the hill. He's going to have his hands up in the air. And Joshua, a picture of Jesus, is the one down there doing the fighting. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand... Amalek prevailed. So Moses also pictures the Lord Jesus Christ. Moses is going to picture the Lord Jesus Christ and that Jesus Christ is the intercessor for us. Hebrews 7.25. Look at Hebrews 7.25. Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. You know, we have one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. When you pray, you pray to the Lord Jesus. He's our way into the throne room. He's our way to the Father. Moses pictures Jesus Christ as the intercessor. He's going to go up and stand up there with his arms in the air. Jesus Christ pictures the Lord Jesus as the one fighting for us. When the Moses has his hands up, Israel is prevailing. When he lets them down, Amalek starts prevailing. And this pictures you lifting up your hands in prayer. 1 Timothy 2, eight. Look at 1 Timothy 2 and verse 8. It says, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. So that's the picture. You got your hands up in the air in prayer. You're, you're keeping a prayer life. And you're going to prevail. You quit praying. You're going to stop prevailing. Now look at 1712. But Moses' hands were heavy. Remember, Jesus said in Matthew 11:28, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Moses' hands were heavy, and they took a stone. Now what's Jesus? Remember, Jesus is the stone. Daniel 321, he's the stone cut without hands. 1 Peter 2.8, he's the stone of stumbling. 
and rock of offense. Matthew 16, 18. What does he say? He says, And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Jesus, referring to himself, calling himself the rock. Jesus is the, the stone. So they took a stone and put it under him. So you, when you're praying, you're resting on the Savior. And he sat there on an Aaron and her stayed up his hands, the one on the one side and the other on the other side, and his hands were heavy, so his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. So you see that? He had to have some people lift him up in prayer. He had, sometimes it's not just, you can't just pray on your own. you got to get some friends to lift you up in prayer as well. His hands were so heavy, he couldn't do it anymore. So he got Aaron and her to lift up his hands. And we don't know much about her, but he's in one of the greatest stories in the Bible. Lifting up one of Moses' arms. And <clears throat> and like I said, you need to go out and fight. Go on and don't fear. Go out and fight here. You need to go up to the throne room. Moses went up. He goes up to the throne room to lift up his hands in prayer. That's what you need to do. Go up to the throne room. You got direct access into that throne room. And he holds up his hands until the going down of the sun. Now, Moses, again, a picture of the Lord Jesus. He's got his arms lifted. Imagine Jesus Christ on the cross. What happened? He had his arms lifted out. He had a guy on his right side and on his left side, just like Moses does here. And it's to the going down of the sun, just like the Lord Jesus on the cross. This is a picture of the crucifixion. Now, look what happens when he's got them hands held up steady. You got Joshua, a picture of the Lord Jesus, down on the ground fighting the battle for him. It says in verse 13, And Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. You see that? It's the Lord that makes the flesh, Amalek, uncomfortable. It, the, Joshua discomfited him. He made him uncomfortable. And he did it with the edge of the sword. That's the next thing. You got to have prayer, you got to have the Lord Jesus, and you got to have the edge of the sword. Hebrews 4:12 for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. So you see all all that is is in action here. So you go on, don't fear. Face the people. Go out, fight the war, fight the flesh. Go up to the throne room, stay in prayer. Just go. Just keep going. Go down with the sun. Finish your course. So notice that verse 12, it said, And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. Go down with the sun. Verse 13, And Joshua discomfited Amalek with his people with the edge of the sword. So go hard with thy might, just like Joshua did. Go on. Go out, go up, go down, and go hard. Just go. Just keep going. Notice that just kept that phrase just kept coming up. Even in verse five, wherewith thou smotest the river, take in thine hand and go. Always telling him to go on. Go up. Now and verse fourteen, and the Lord said unto Moses. Write this for a memorial in a book, and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua. For I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. Proverbs 10, 7 says, The name of the wicked shall rot. You go around trying to make your name for yourself, like they did back there at Babel in Genesis 11. You're just going to make a bad name for yourself. The name of the wicked shall rot. And he told him, Write this for a memorial in a book. So write it in a book. The Lord wants us to write some things. So you don't forget it. It's a memorial. And something good happens, God answers a prayer, write it down. So you don't forget it. He gives you a good thought throughout the day, write it down so you don't forget it. So verse 15, And Moses built an altar and called the name of it Jehovah Nisi. For he said, Because the Lord hath sworn... 
The Lord hath sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. So that's a picture of a continuous war with the flesh. You're going to have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Every day you're going to wake up and you got to reckon your flesh to be dead. You have to die daily. You have to say, I'm going to do what God wants me to do today. I'm going to choose God over what my flesh wants. What is my? What did my flesh want to do as soon as I woke up this morning? The first thing it said was, you set your alarm about two hours too early. Just go back to sleep. My flesh tells me that every single day. My, the first step to me beating the flesh was getting up anyway. It's almost like, I don't know about you, but getting up in the morning is like a boxing match. It's like you've already been knocked out. You're already laying on your back. And everything's telling you just stay down. But you got to get up anyway and, and get into the fight again. So you get up and let the first thing you do be studying the Bible, doing something for the Lord. The reason I got up was to do this lesson. If I didn't do it in this in the morning, it would be really hard for me to find a quiet time throughout the day to be able to do it again. So I got up. And every day you get up early. You rise up early in the morning. That is putting a dent in the flesh. Your flesh does not want to get up early. Then, you know, you're faced with the temptations throughout the day. That the flesh is bugging you about. You got people at work that's bugging you. You want to grab them and smack them. Punch them in the throat. Kick them between the legs. Push them down the stairs. Whatever. You got to say no. These are, these are lost sinners with souls. You got to be example. You got to reckon your flesh to be dead. Don't live for this sinful corpse that you're walking around in. And you be a testimony to the world. You go on and you don't fear them. And then you've got a really big battle sometimes throughout the day. And you go out and fight the war just like Joshua did. And then when it, it's, it's so hard it's getting you down and you're, you're losing it, you go up to the throne room and you get some help from the Lord, pray, pray it out. And you just got you just keep going all the way into the end of the day, so that you don't look back at this day and say, "I wish I would have done this better. I wish I would have done that better. I, sh I should have done this. I should have done that." You go all the way into the going down of the sun. You go down with the sun. Finish your course for that day. Finish the course for your life. You go hard with all your might. Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. Just keep going. Just like the title of this, if I had a title, it would be Just Go. Just get up and go. Just go ahead and do it and get it over with. You've got to live this life. You might as well just go ahead and do it and get it over with. But this has been Exodus chapter 17. Just go.